All right, well, good morning. Thank you so much for stopping by, and, uh, and uh, I heard that this is, has been a really good turnout uh, in support of Professor Jaramillo's talk. I'm going to try to be brief, try to be brief with the things that he said. Uh, Professor Jaramillo, in terms of the research, we have a lot of things in common, so I could, I could stay here and talk for days about, about the Jaramillo group work. But, but let me give you some, a little bit of details in terms of his background. Uh, professor Aramillo is an associate professor of chemical engineering uh, and director of SUNCAT, which he will uh, give a lot of details today. He's native of Puerto Rico, which is a, a, a migrant place as well. And uh, he, he uh, did his bachelor's degree at Stanford, MS and PhD in Santa Barbara, and then he went across the East to do a postdoc. So um, I'm not going to go too much in details in terms of the science, but if I have to tell you, uh, as a young uh, faculty, if there's a model to follow in terms of you know, being able to successfully advertise for your science and check all the boxes, I can definitely tell you hands down, Higher Media Group is a great representation of that. His work has been featured in almost every great journal you can possibly imagine. And one of the cool things about him is that although you see him, you know, maybe even younger than me, um, his leadership uh, capabilities are, up, up, are, are, are bar none ex exception. You know, you can see uh, 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 Professor Jaramillo in, in, a, in, a, in a conference room where there is all these, you know, well, world-renowned physicists and chemists and chemical engineers, and uh, Professor Jaramillo finds the way on how to have everyone converge into things that I could say about Tom. And then in terms of accolades, you know, he's had the resident award from the Rustic Institute, the Presidential Early Career Award, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy of Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Program Research and Development Award, NSF Career Awards, you name them, okay? So we are very, very, very honored that you're here, um, and we are going to have a very good talk. So please, if you can all join me in welcoming Professor Jaramillo. I just turned it on, so I think we're okay. Let me start by saying thank you, Jesus. That was just a, such a lovely introduction, a wonderful introduction. I am, I've been looking forward to this visit for a long time. I've been to UC Davis campus on multiple occasions, generally more casually. This is kind of my first like formal visit, and, uh, and I look forward to more. Uh, this is a, an amazing community of scholars that has really uh, has had my eyes since the day, uh, actually back in my days as a PhD student, which I'll get to in a second, because my understanding is that we want to talk maybe a few minutes about career stuff. I'd really happy to talk about that, then we'll dive into the science. But uh, one, of the, one of the people uh, to my right here, Professor Frank Osterloh, was one of the great inspirations to me as a PhD student. We met at an ACS meeting a long time ago when I was uh, back in those days doing some graduate studies, just trying to figure things out. Frank gave this unbelievable talk. Uh, and it's no surprise to anyone here. Uh, we know Frank. We know what he does. He had all this great fundamental scientific approaches to uh, understanding things and then used that knowledge, that really fundamental knowledge, to actually make some really cool materials. In this case, it was magnetic materials that he was talking about. He was able to make these awesome nanomaterials. They performed super well. It just fit the construct of the theories that guided his work. And not only was he able to make high performance materials, he was able to uh, it further deepen our understanding as to how they work thanks to the work that he had done in that space. And I was just like, oh my goodness, this, this person has it together. That's how science should be done. That was an amazing inspiration to me, and I carry with that uh, to this day. So uh, uh, Frank, one of the certainly bright spots in this community and many, many more bright spots that are sitting around the room. I'm just so excited for Davis. I look forward to, to lots more engagement to come. Uh, let, me, let me just say so a few things kind of career-wise for background, uh, so just to give you a sense uh, to kind of a little more granularity, and, and, uh, and I'm always happy to discuss these things. We have a lot of early stage uh, uh, scientists and engineers in the room, and if there's anything that I can do to be of help, uh, please let me know. 
happy to happy to help in any which way. So, uh, oops, uh, as Jesus mentioned, we're both from Puerto Rico. I'm from Carolina, technically born in Santurce, and uh, you know, obviously, Puerto Rico has had some tough times of late. It's been in the news for some awful reasons, but we have had some good things happening. Uh, number one, definitely, the island is uh, proving a lot of resilience and just amazing. The spirit people are are, are for millions of people who are getting getting things back right again. Uh, and, and we have a lot of good things happening otherwise. Uh, a couple years ago, we got our first uh, Olympic gold medalist was Monica Puig, uh, Sonia Sotomayor on the Supreme Court, uh, Lin Manuel Miranda doing amazing things uh, in, in the, the world of theater, um, and Jesus Velasquez here at UC Davis. Uh, these are all people that I'm very proud of and many, many others. I'm just really excited. Uh, so yeah, I was 18 years old and I wasn't sure where I wanted to study, stay on the island for college, you know, go to the mainland, east coast, west coast, uh, somewhere in the middle. So I was applying to all kinds of different opportunities. I ended up going to Stanford uh, to, to, uh, to do my undergraduate. Wasn't sure at all what I wanted to study. Arrived uh, with knowing only two things. Number one, I did not want to be a medical doctor, 100% sure of that. And I was 99% sure I did not want to be an engineer. Okay, so that's the landscape that I walked into, uh, and I was just like, cool, you know, Stanford's very, uh, for undergrads there, They're, you don't actually have to declare until junior year, so it's like, oh, lots of room to figure out what I want to study, and I get there, like, all my friends, like, all my new friends in my freshman dorm, they know exactly what they want to do, they've got, like, they know what major they want to be, they've got the next four years mapped out, they've got the next five years career after that, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, and it's like, oh my goodness, this pressure, uh, so it was actually really a tough, tough thing to, for me to, you know, I'm moving, it's like, it's, I mean, it's a new world. Uh, those of you who are not from the state of California, you've got to California, this is a different place. It's like totally new world to be in. I'm just trying to navigate this, but kind of found my way to chemical engineering, uh, uh, mostly because I convinced myself that that major would empower me to have an impact on the world more so than any other. And uh, maybe that's a true statement, and maybe it's not a true statement. That's just my reflection for myself. Uh, certainly not an over generality, but that's that's what kind of got me into chemical engineering. I felt like being able to manipulate molecules and control molecules and do things at scale was was going to be an important thing. So uh, decided to major in that, but I still did had no idea. By the way, no idea I was going to become a professor. None, zero, not anywhere close to the radar screen. Not even being on the radar screen of the radar screen. It was, it was so so far away. Uh, but then you know. Something interesting happened. I, I was able to get a job uh, after my junior year uh, at, at Boeing in, uh, in Seattle. And uh, that was a very serendipitous uh, occasion because, you know, when I was, uh, I worked for a tutoring program. I was a tutor coordinator. I would go to East Palo Alto, those of you who are familiar. It's, it's a very uh, under-resourced uh, area. And so, you know, a number of us, we would go and, and just tutor kids twice a week, at middle school, high school, uh, or even elementary. And, uh, and we got a great check, uh, almost a blank check to go to this warehouse in San Francisco this one day on a Saturday to go buy books for the kids. So we jumped on that opportunity, we, and, but the only problem was there was a job fair happening. Uh, this is during my junior year, a job fair happening, but I, and I knew I was going to miss it, but I was like, you know, we got to get these books for the kids. So we got, you know, we went out, it's this grimy place, I come back, I'm just totally tired, I'm dead tired, and uh, feeling very gross, not, not job fair uh, ready. And the job fair is ending in 20 minutes anyway. I'm walking back to my room, uh, walking back to my house, and I bump into a buddy of mine. David Warder is his name. Uh, he works at EJ Gallo. He's been at Gallo for many years since graduation. He's moving up that, the chain of command there. And, uh, and he says, Tom, you're going, to the, uh, you're going to the job fair, right? And I said, no, I'm at it ends in 20 minutes. Look at me. He's like, your room is two minutes away. You go there, put on a shirt and tie, grab a stack of resumes, and show up and just distribute them and see what happens. And I'm like, Okay, how am I going to argue with that? So that's exactly what I did. Went to the job fair, dropped off resumes, talked to a representative of Boeing, got an interview, got a job. And that was the one and only research experience I ended up having during my entire undergraduate years. Okay? So I, I didn't even know what research was. And that was the first thing to put on the radar screen. I come back to Stanford campus for my senior year, and some faculty were hosting a session of, okay, for those of you who uh, you know, feel like you're clueless seniors and don't know what you want to do with your life, you know, stop by the, this room and we'll give you some advice. So I get there and talk to some of the professors, say, all right, what are you interested in? Oh, I'm interested in this. Okay, that's not helpful. Uh, I'm interested in that. Uh, tell me something else. I'm interested in that. That's useless. Uh, uh, I'm going down the list. I enjoyed my, my job at Boeing. Uh, or, oh, what'd you do? Oh, I did this. And, that's research. And I said, oh, I guess. And they said, well, why don't you go to graduate school? 
uh, I said, I'm done with school. Uh, and they said, no, 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 PhD is different. You know, it's actually doing research, actually in a lab, and you're developing technologies. It's like, oh, okay, maybe I'll apply. So I applied uh, to grad schools, different kinds. I applied to jobs, got a number of different job offers, um, and ultimately elected to go to UCSB uh, for my PhD. So that was just kind of, and, and I asked myself the question, what if I didn't bump into David Warder? on that way to, uh, to my room. I mean, if I had walked two minutes earlier or two minutes later, I would have totally missed him, and who knows what would have happened. And so that, that leads me to like my one piece of career advice I absolutely want to share with everybody. And that's one of my quota favorite quotations, and it is, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Okay, so that's a very important message that I live by. If you, know, if you don't take the shot, you're not gonna make the shot. So, you know, so give it a go. Give it a go and see what happens. Uh, so after, so, uh, after uh, gra actually graduating with my bachelor's degree, I then went to, to do a summer internship between grad school and undergrad. I worked at uh, now a Dow facility, which was Roman Haas back in then, uh, making acrylates by the megaton. Uh, on the Houston Ship Channel, very traditional chemical engineering. Uh, then to UCSB, where I worked on my, my graduate work. Uh, during that time, I also went to work at Springhouse, Pennsylvania, which was the R&D headquarters for uh, Roman Haas, so then doing more you know, R&D type activities within that general domain. Uh, graduated, uh, met Frank Osterloh along the way, and, uh, and then did my postdoc in uh, Europe, uh, went out to the to Technical University of Denmark, working closely uh, with Yves Korkendorf as my advisor, and working closely also with Jens Narsko, developing uh, lifelong uh, friendships and, uh, and professional working relationships with them, and then somehow managed to get uh, back to Stanford and get a, a job. And so that's kind of like uh, how the career trajectory went. I mean, one thing I want to share here is that there's uh, at, at, at the point at which I decided uh, that I might want to become interested in a faculty member was during the fourth year of my PhD. Okay, so there is, uh, there, it's a nonlinear route to get to the faculty position that I have today. Uh, there's a lot of people who are very directed on that, and I, I applaud that level of vision and, and, and uh, planning. But for those of you who are unsure, that's okay too. And you can tell from my, I hope I convey that message that along this way, it's like, I don't know what my next step is, and just kind of make it one step at a time. And, uh, and it can lead you to some good places. So that's another just take home message. I view it as a tree where, you know, this is maybe a little bit of a trite uh, metaphor, but you're a grasshopper hopping up uh, the bark of a tree, or the, the trunk of a tree, and there's very little, let's say, between the ages of zero and 18 that you have control over, you know, where you live and, and uh, where you go to school, you know, your parents are, are very much in, in control of these types of decisions, and then you make your first branching point, like, where do I go to college, and then what do I major in, and then do I go to grad school, and the point is all the meanwhile, you're building skills at what you do, and then soon enough, you find yourself towards, uh, you know, as you make your way up this tree, you might ask, oh, what if I had taken a different route? What if I had done, taken a different branch? A different... The truth is that as you go up to the canopy of the tree, there's all the branches start intersecting, and then you can actually completely navigate that space in new ways. And so no options are ever closed to you. And so there's always options. And so that's another thing I just want to relax. If it, those of you who might be feeling pressure about, oh, what job or what career or what, you know, life hopefully is long for all of us. And there's many, many ways to navigate that well. Um, another another like take home message I just wanted to bring up uh, another one of my favorite quotes is that's gotten me through a lot of things is life is ten percent what happens to you and ninety percent how you react to it. Okay, and that one is, uh, you know, or I've, another version is 90% is your attitude towards it. So remember, you're in control. Like, kind of, there's a lot of things in our life that are not in our control. Things happen, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. It's our response to it that really matters, and that's what dictates our life and, and how we feel. So remember that you're in control of that side of the equation. And the last thing uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, bring up are just kind of my three fundamental tenets for how I operate for whatever it's worth. And there's a lot of things that I try to employ in my everyday life, but these are the three things, is uh, do, do your best, very simple. Do your best, the best is all that anyone can ever ask of you. Never can we ask for anything more. So do your best in everything you do, and just give it your, tr your best try. 
Number two, work with honesty and integrity at every step. Okay? Be honest, operate with integrity. And just that is your guiding light for making decisions and navigating very complex spaces. Uh, and then the final thing, let's see, do your best. Honesty and integrity is the, the third one I wanted to offer. Hang on one second. That's right. Take care of others. Look out for others. Help each other out. Okay, and sometimes you're in a position to help others. Sometimes others are in a position to help you. And if we all have that attitude, we all help each other and everybody wins. So those are like the three fundamental tenets as to, to how I operate. All right, so thank you, Frank. Super, all right, so uh, should we start talking about some tech? <laughs> Any questions on that? And then, or if not, we can also save it for later for a more open Q&A. That's okay, you can, you can feel free to collect your questions. All right, so let's dive into some tech and I wanna start with just giving you a landscape of the ecosystem that I'm part of these days. Oops, that's a little bit too fast. Uh, so I am now recently been appointed the director of the SunCat Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. This is a partnership between Slack and Stanford. Uh, we have about 100 researchers, total students, postdocs, senior personnel, all working towards advancing areas in really energy transformations is ultimately what we're trying to do. So I work with a lot of people and I'll be uh, bringing them up periodically. Key to how we operate is we're, we're very much a theory driven center. I'm an experimentalist by training, but we have a lot of wonderful theoreticians that provide a lot of insights that help us help guide the, the design and synthesis of materials. Of course, once we synthesize them, we characterize them using many different methods Methods, evaluate what works, what doesn't in terms of catalysis, and we can feed that back into theory to refine that theory and then ultimately keep circling the loop. And the idea is to be all the meanwhile understanding materials, understanding catalysts, understanding surfaces and interfaces better to the point where we can design higher performance systems. And really what we want to do is provide solutions for sustainable processes. That's the name of the game. Uh, we want to operate sustainably as a society and currently we clearly do not. There's lots of room for improvement, but I want to make sure that we all appreciate what we have in the ground today. It's actually phenomenal, perhaps the greatest achievement by humans in the history of our species. Uh, you look at a molecule like hydrogen. Will we ever have a hydrogen economy? Hmm, I wonder, guess what? We already make over 60 billion kilos a year of hydrogen. Okay, it almost all comes from fossil fuels. If you divide by the seven or so billion people on Earth, it's about nine kilograms per person a year production rate. That is a massively scaled molecule, and that's just one of many molecules that we use globally. Where does that hydrogen typically go? Typically goes to baking fertilizer. We like to eat, right? And this Haber-Bosch process, we can be very thankful for because the natural nitrogen cycle maybe only supplies enough nitrogen and a fertilizer, natural fertilizer for a billion or two, people, two billion people on Earth. This process allows for the rest of the world to eat, okay, providing food uh, to many. And this is at 150 billion kilograms a year, about 20 kilos per person. Uh, gasoline, uh, transportation, um, heating, you know, there's so many different products. This is an oil refinery in Baton Rouge, processes at 100,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, gasoline is just one of many refined products that come from petroleum. Gasoline is at a clip of about a trillion kilograms a year, 130 kilos per person per year, averaged across the globe. Plastics, another big time industry. In fact, this is the Houston Ship Channel. That's where I worked uh, back in the day making plastics, uh, which we make at about 300 billion kilograms a year, 40 kilos a person. So the point I want to make here is that yes, fossil fuels have issues. There's no doubt about that. Yes, we want to be more sustainable. Let's take a moment to appreciate what we have in the ground, the technology that has allowed billions of people to have the quality of life that we enjoy. Mind you, not all billions of people have the same quality of life. So there's a lot of other challenges, not just sustainability, but also access. And these are some of the points that I want to bring today. Uh, one thing that has changed, you know, the ecosystem is changing fast and this is something it's changed. It, our, our, our whole world is just moving really quickly how we operate the paradigm of operation and I just want everybody to recognize that if you're thinking about the future and technologies that you might be interested in developing, you know, don't skate to where the puck is, you skate to where the puck will be. I don't play hockey, I'm from the Caribbean, but I use that analogy anyway. 
Uh, and so one thing that's changing about our landscape is the dropping price of renewable electricity. If you want to make fuels and chemicals using renewable electricity, you know, in 2009, why, I had people who scoffed at the idea, and of course they would. Look at this price of solar. It's $35 a megawatt hour. That's 35 cents a kilowatt hour. Extremely expensive. Wind was at about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. But these prices are dropping. They're about 5 cents a kilowatt hour now, and that is actually cost competitive and in some cases even cheaper than any conventional source out there. Okay, and so and then we all know that there's this variable nature to electricity that is going to be a challenge. Finding ways to store that and use that are, are becoming more and more important. So this is this is the evolving landscape that if you're skating to where the puck will be, uh, you you can actually make predictions to when a technology goes from doesn't make sense to makes a lot of sense. But how do we create that new paradigm? I'm going to offer some suggestions here, things to think about. Renewable electricity prices. If renewable electricity gets down to, say, one cent a kilowatt hour and is pervasive across the globe, that is a massive game changer. That will completely start flipping paradigms left and right. But that alone will uh, only go so far. Energy storage, if we get energy storage down to, say, $10 a kilowatt hour. So the batteries in, coming out of the Tesla Gigafactory are roughly $150 to $200 a kilowatt hour. So that's not going to get there. We need to go an order of magnitude cheaper than even what they're dreaming they can get to. Uh, carbon capture, $30 a ton CO2. If you can capture CO2 at $30 a ton, then that provides a carbon-based feedstock at a low price that you can then utilize to make all kinds of carbon-based products. And then you need the, the price of your device, the price of your technology, the capital expenditures. Uh, it has to be really cheap. A lot of these chemicals that we buy every day, they're so scaled, they're so wonderful. That's all the scientists and engineers in history who've developed these things. They can get stuff down to like 50 cents a kilogram you know, a dollar a kilogram. So if you want to be able to compete with fossil fuel based prices, your capex has to be like 20 cents a kilogram to which you can add, say, cost of electricity, energy storage, price of new feedstocks, and then you can maybe compete on a, on a head to head basis. So if you can do all four of these things, you have completely shattered the paradigm. Nobody would ever build another oil refinery. They could make gasoline, for instance, way cheaper, assuming you can do all these things. So there's, but there's a lot of technical challenges. Uh, to get there, and that's what I'll be talking about today. And this is kind of the vision, maybe the graphical version of what could happen. A subset of possibilities. We need transportation, we need fuels, we need chemicals, we need materials, we need building materials, we need uh, fertilizers. There's all kinds of products that we need. Almost all of these come from fossil fuels. Can we take more renewable feedstock, CO2 from the air at 400 parts per million and climbing water, nitrogen, and, or even lower intensity carbon feedstocks and do chemical transformations using uh, electrons that are coming from renewable resources, direct solar photons, uh, and either make the products right off the bat or feed them into more conventional processes based on temperature and pressure. Lots of opportunity in this space. This is just a tiny snippet of possibilities. And I think ultimately integrating a, a system-wide, uh, system it has to be integrated system-wide to ultimately hit the cost targets that, that we're hoping for. So with that being said, let me talk about the three fundamental questions that I'm going to try to address here. And now we're going to get, that was all high level stuff. I want to get down into the nitty gritty, get down to the molecules, get down to the atoms, get down to the electrons. How can we accelerate linkages between new catalysts? Let's say you come up with some new catalysts. How do you link that to new devices, processes, and technologies? Another question, how can we leverage surface structure and, and reaction conditions to steer catalysis? And thirdly, when facing really big challenges in catalyzing a reaction, are there ways to work around them? So I want to kind of address all three of these points, and I'm going to use uh, these reactions to speak to each of these particular questions. I'll talk about hydrogen evolution from water, uh, converting uh, CO2 into fuels and chemicals with renewable processes, and then making ammonia. All right, so let's talk about hydrogen first. So what would a, a chemical plant look like? This is chemical engineering 101. Uh, cool, let's say you, you made some really neat catalyst or device in your lab. What would this thing actually look like at scale? So this is actually done by Proton Onsite. It's a company that sells uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers. So PEM electrolyzer is just like a, a fuel cell, but it in reverse. And you need more than an electrolyzer, naturally. Uh, these are the, these gray boxes you see are the electrolyzers. Uh, but you need power management, you need water management, you need hydrogen management, all kinds of control systems, et cetera. What is the cost of this thing? Well, their, their future targets, based on their technologies, um, gets down to a capital cost if they make 50 tons a day of hydrogen, which is not, uh, not a small amount. It's pretty substantial. It's about a 100 megawatt facility, if, if you want to think of it in terms of electricity. Uh, that's about 50 or 60 cents per kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, is that cheap or is it not? Well, hydrogen in the United States is about $1.20 a 
a kilogram. So if you're getting free electricity to power this thing, this thing looks really good. But of course, electricity does have some cost to it. And again, 10 years ago, the cost of electricity were so high that that would dominate everything. And, and this would be uh, a tiny drop in the bucket, and, and the electricity would kill it uh, from the start. But now, with electricity prices dropping, that's starting to look more attractive. Every, every one cent in kilowatt hours that goes cheaper, this becomes more, uh, more interesting. Uh, and so, but then there's, we still got to want to lower the price here because we've got to get cost competitive. And where the, this pie chart shows you where all the costs are coming from, most of that 54% is the stack, which are these gray boxes. And a lot of that 54% is the precious metal catalyst. There's a lot of platinum and iridium in these things. So a lot of our research efforts have been aimed at trying to reduce precious metal content. Um, so I'm going to show you some of our, our work in that space, and uh, here are some of the wonderful people that have been involved in this project, scholars from day one. Jibo Chen was one of our first PhD students, Jakob Kiebskor, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be mentioning uh, some of the others as we go along the way. So we were ultimately inspired by Mother Nature. So Mother Nature found a really great way to make something that is every bit as good as platinum as a hydrogen catalyst without any precious metals. If we look at, uh, these are active site models of nitrogenase and hydrogenase done by Beard Hinnemann and Jens Norsko back in 2004. And so they understood why these catalysts are so good. And again, no precious metals in sight. And what they found was that it's these sulfurs that are actually active for the reaction. Uh, these sulfurs here, but not the sulfurs here. These sulfurs are coordinated to three metals. These sulfurs on the edges are coordinated to only two. And so there's something about under-coordinated sulfur. And that motivated many of us to look at uh, motifs that have under-coordinated sulfur and look no further than this material MOS2, molybdenum disulfide. It's a, basically a sandwich of sulfur, molybdenum, sulfur, and then these sandwiches are stacked on top of each other with van der Waals interactions, much like uh, graphite. And the sulfurs on the top and the bottom of this, of this uh, slab are not expected to be active for the same reasons these aren't up here. They're coordinated to three metals, but the sulfurs that decorate the edge are under-coordinated and resemble this motif here. So this inspired us to look into the system. And the funny thing is, at the time, when we looked at, at research papers, lots of people had studied molybdenum sulfide, actually, for hydrogen evolution. They all said it wasn't very good. I was like, yeah, it's OK. But it turns out uh, that's because they were all looking at single crystals. And single crystals, of course, don't have a whole lot of these edges. And why were they looking at single crystals? Because MOS2 is a very abundant material. It's a mineral you find in the Earth's crust. I buy them for 10 bucks a single crystal in my lab. Okay, So you just take it, you scotch tape it, you make a clean surface, and you can make really cool measurements, but not lots of edge sites. So then uh, when I was a postdoc working with Ebe and, and working together with uh, several others, uh, we went about synthesizing these nano triangles of MOS2 and, and using scanning tunneling microscopy to characterize the edges so we could quantify the edges. And it turns out, wow, these things are very active if you have a lot of edges. And we could actually correlate the edge length and the activity. And then when I started my lab at Stanford, we, we started making all kinds of different uh, structures of MOS2 with that design principle in mind. Lots of nanowires and nanoporous materials and small molecular clusters. Long and the short of it, the, the more edge sites you build into your material, the higher the activity, your electrode. And so we can measure this with current voltage uh, traces, where we're me measuring voltage on this axis versus the reversible hydrogen electrode, which means if you hold your electrode at zero, the reaction's in equilibrium. So backwards and forwards are the same rate. If you had a piece of platinum, as soon as you tilt it just slightly negative, it takes off. You start making hydrogen. All these catalysts require more than what platinum would require in terms of voltage. But notice that as you go from one to two to three, the more edge sites you build in, this curve starts marching closer and closer to zero, which is a good thing. Now, the field has gone, come a long way. We and many others are making all kinds of different formulations, sulfides, and then moving on to phosphides and phosphosulfides and all kinds of interesting materials. And, and the long and the short is that there's uh, these non precious materials, they're all ionic compounds. They're getting closer and closer and closer to platinum. Nobody to this day, to my knowledge, has ever made one that is, is as good as platinum. In fact, it's about six orders of magnitude away in terms of turnover frequency. One thing to bear in mind is when you measure, those of you who do electrocatalysis, uh, yes, normalizing your current to the geometric area of your electrode is a good thing to do. Please try to normalize also to the surface area and to the number of sites. And once you do that, so platinum looks just marginally better than some of these non-precious metal systems. But when you, when you normalize for surface area, it turns out to be about, in my estimation, six orders of magnitude better. Okay, so just bear that. There's lots of room to improve non-precious metal catalysts. That's true not only for solid state non-precious metal materials, but even the, the uh, organic complexes or the inorganic complexes, I should say, that have been uh, some of the highest performance ones out there. So there still is a gap.
Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to start making them into devices. So here's Desmond, who started taking some of these sulfides and phosphides and whatnot and started making ink formulations that were friendly for a membrane electrode assembly format. This is exactly like the heart and soul of a PEM electrolyzer. And so we made our own in-house system. This is only five square centimeters in area, very modest in size. And the Iridium Platinum one, of course, is a very good performer. It, it, uh, this, now we're drawing about one amp per square centimeter, which is where the commercial technology is. That's the order of magnitude. And if you swap out the platinum with the non-precious metal systems, you pay about 0.2 volts. Okay, and you know, so that's the gap. You know, if you were to improve the precious, the non-precious metal materials uh, by a few orders of magnitude, then you can actually get these things laying on top of each other, and then we don't have to have any trade-offs, right? Then we can say they're actually. Why would you use platinum when you can use something way cheaper? Uh, and and uh, again, 10 years ago. Nobody would want to buy this electrolyzer. I shouldn't say nobody, but very few people because electricity was so expensive that those 0.2 volts you're paying per electron way too much would dominate the cost. But now in a situation where electricity prices are dropping with renewables, sometimes it's even they'll pay you to take electricity. It just kind of changes your view of uh, efficiency, right? Maybe you're better off with a, a cheaper electrolyzer that is less efficient and that might be a better cost target. Uh, nevertheless, we still, we're still still working to try to improve activity of these things, and we can talk about that uh, later. But uh, let me show you where we've taken this since uh, Mackenzie and Lori, here they are making uh, cobalt phosphides that are now loaded high surface area, cobalt phosphides on high surface area carbon. Uh, we worked together with Proton Onsite. We shipped them catalysts um, to integrate into their commercial electrolyzer. They literally sell this electrolyzer. It's 86 square centimeters, operates at uh, 400 PSI, 50 degrees C, again, platinum iridium. And we want to ask the question, well, how does our catalyst that we're sending you, how, how do they perform in your system? And uh, they performs really well. Now they're taking it to 1.8 amps per square centimeter. That's their uh, commercial operating condition. And yes, you're losing 0.2 volts, which is exactly what we expected. But boy, it was really nice to see that it worked in their format. And then they did a long-term stability test. They ran this thing for 1,800 hours, continuously cranking out the 1.8 amps per square centimeter, measuring voltage along the way, and it's extremely stable. They showed uh, no, no real signs of degradation. The only reason why it went to 1,800 hours is because they turned the thing off, and that was the end of that particular project. This was funded by the Navy. It turns out the Navy is a customer that is interested in low-cost electrolyzers. Um, so this was, uh, and, and part of what was really cool about working together with them in this construct was that uh, when Kathy Ayers, the VP of R&D, was saying, okay, Tom, tell me about all the things you do with your catalyst. How do you make inks? How do you get it onto electrode? We need to figure this out because we have all these proprietary processes we can share with you. And I said, Kathy, you know, okay, here's our publications. Here's what we do. But honestly, just, do, just treat it like platinum and let's see what happens. And that's exactly what this data is. So they need like no optimization. They just kind of plug and play it into their normal procedures. And so this was, uh, to me, really an exciting result because this is the first, I think, demonstration of something that 15 years ago didn't exist where decent non-precious metal catalysts for hydrogen going from really fundamentals to now actually getting them into commercial grade technology. And I see this as kind of like the flagship for really for a whole bunch of other processes, CO2 and ammonia and all these other things. So let me transition now to CO2 and, and uh, ask the question of how do we leverage surface structure and reaction conditions to steer catalysis? Because when you're converting CO2, unlike hydrogen, when you make hydrogen from water, there's almost all catalysts out there are 100% selective to make H2. If you start trying to convert CO2 into anything, there's a whole range of products that, that you might make. Um, now, th thermochemically, this is how in modern industry works. We can do a lot with syngas and converting syngas to different things. We've been working in that space, too. Here's Melis, who's been making uh, thermal catalysts. Actually, we learned a lot about the phosphides through hydrogen and then transferred that information to thermal heterogeneous catalysis. So here she's, we're making packed bed reactors with uh, this MO, MOP on silica. And one thing that she's been able to show is uh, a catalyst that, unlike the commercial methanol synthesis catalyst, which is very sensitive to the feed ratio of syngas that you feed in, this one doesn't care what ratio of CO and CO2 you have. And so that just, we think, is a way of opening up flexibility that if you had a process grabbing CO2 from the air, it could be 100% CO2 even, uh, you can just take renewable hydrogen from an electrolyzer, feed it with CO2, and make methanol. And so there's just there's a whole world of coupling, I think, bio with electro, electro with thermal, thermal with photo. You know, there's all these forms of, of catalyzing transformations. 
but now getting back to electrocatalysis, you know, I think the big challenge in CO2 electrocatalysis is steering selectivity. How do you how do you get the electrons to say not attack the water and make H2, but actually attack the CO2 and make formate or CO or formaldehyde or methanol or methane or or C2 plus compounds, be they oxygenated or hydrocarbons? So many different possibilities, and and to think about this, uh, it's always good to think about thermodynamics and kinetics. Let me also first thank the, uh, all the wonderful individuals I've had a chance to work together with. I want to uh, mention a couple, Kendra and Natasha, two of the very earliest researchers in our group uh, and the first to work in CO2 reduction. They've recently started a company called Opus 12 to commercialize CO2 electrolysis processes. I also want to call out Chris Han, who a, was a postdoc in the group and now a staff scientist, uh, and he's just amazing and is just part of everything I'm going to show you today. Um, so talking about the thermodynamics and kinetics, so here's the deal. So in electrochemistry, you can write out all these reactions, proton and electron transfers. You can stick protons and electrons onto CO2 uh, to make CO or methane or ethylene or alcohols. And in thermodynamics in electrochemistry, we use equilibrium potentials as a way of quantifying that. And this is just to say at what voltage does your electrode need to be versus a reversible hydrogen electrode to get the reaction to be in equilibrium. And if you go negative of these values, then you favor reduction. And if you go positive of the values, you favor oxidation. And the point is, no matter what the product is, you can see that all these equilibrium potentials are very close to each other, which tells you the overall thermodynamics are very similar. And they're very similar to that of hydrogen, which is one way of saying that's why selectivity is hard. Thermodynamics is not going to help us. The overall thermodynamics of the reactions are almost all identical. You give me electrons uh, and protons of a certain chemical potential, and they can attack any and all of these things. So how do we start thinking about this? I'm, let me, let's dive into the details of methane. So kinetics, oh, sorry, the thermodynamics are not going to, it's not where the selectivity is going to uh, be of value. It's all about the kinetics in the process. So let's talk about some of the steps that we might encounter. So you got a CO2 molecule impinging on a surface. These are calculations done by Andy Peterson and Jens Norsko and others. Uh, Andy is now at, at Brown University. You stick it with a proton electron, you make a carboxy. You hit it again, you hit the hydroxyl to make water. You've got CO left behind. You hit that with a proton electron, you make formal. Then you make formaldehyde. Then you make methoxy. Notice the methoxy is sticking up. So if the next proton electron hit down low, you make methanol. If it hits up high, you make methane. So I said, let's look at the methane process. So we make methane. You got this oxygen down here. You got to hit it with two more protons and electrons to make water. Clear that off the surface. Now you can go back to step one. And you can see just the kinetics. I mean, that's just that's, that's one of the smaller molecules that you can imagine. I mean, so many steps you're asking your catalyst to do, way more complicated than, say, hydrogen evolution. Proton plus proton, two electrons makes H2. So that's one kinetic challenge is competing with hydrogen. Um, another thing is that, boy, if you want a, a catalyst that can do this well, you need the catalyst that can do all of these steps well, each and every one of them. If you've got seven beautiful steps and one bad step, we call that the rate determining step, you got yourself a bad catalyst. And then you say, okay, let's say I only have one bad step, I want to make that step better. The challenge is that you start improving that step a lot of these intermediates are correlated in terms of how they're bound to the surface. You make one step better, but then you make another step worse, or trading that off. And then even if you could get all the steps to be good, then you still have the challenge that many of the intermediates for these species are going to be similar. You're going to have similar mechanistic steps, probably. So then how do you steer the selectivity to one versus the other? These are just, we're just unpacking some of the challenges with CO2. So to start addressing some of those challenges, uh, we started off really with a blank sheet of paper. We started looking into the literature and Kendra and Natasha and others. And we said, okay, what, what methods do we use? You know, what do we, you know, fuel cells people use this and hydrogen people use that. And we just didn't find any real standard method. And, and so we said, okay, well, let's build something from scratch that we think might be good. And so we came up with a cell design that looks something like this. And this is kind of generation 3.0. And the long and the short of this one is that we use a very large electric area, six square centimeters, and a very small electrolyte volume, like eight mils. And the point is, by having a large area of electrode and a small volume, you can really be sensitive to identify the, the products of reaction, to identify them and to quantify them, which we use with GC on stream and NMR in the liquid phase. So we typically run a one-hour experiment at different potentials, and, and during the course of this, we're measuring the on-stream products, and then we take out aliquots to do NMR. Um, when we did this on copper, we took a very simple copper. You buy it from Alpha Azar, you clean it up, you polish it up, stick it in the cell. What do you get? Polycrystalline, nothing fancy. Um, we saw 16 different reaction products, 
and we saw every product that had ever been reported before off copper, plus five more that had never been reported. We saw them all in one consistent study. We could also track quantitatively their reaction rates as a function of voltage. And the list is wonderful. You look at all the C1s and C2s and C3s, and we got carboxylic acids, we got aldehydes, we got alcohols, we got hydrocarbons, we got all kinds of cool stuff, but they're all kind of emerging together. And so you got a separations problem. So this is not going to be a winning catalyst for a commercial process because you're just whatever good you can do by using renewable electricity to make this, uh, you're going to have to pay in the separations. Now, this is extraordinary. Let me just say for a moment, this, what I just told you, this is STP chemistry. You could grab a bottle of Pellegrino or Perrier, stick an alpha azar copper electrode, and give it some voltage, and this is what you make. Okay, that's what we're talking about. It's extraordinary. Uh, but we've got to control it better. So let's talk about surface structure. I, I, when I first started presenting those results, people would ask me left and right, what about single crystals? What about single crystals? And I love single crystals. Uh, those of you who maybe have done single crystal electrochemistry know that typically they're really, really small because you want high fidelity surface. And uh, we need six square centimeters so we can actually see these types of products and, and separate them. Uh, but Chris came up with something really clever. And uh, reading the literature, uh, you can use interfacial energy. If you grow copper on different surfaces, on different uh, substrate materials, you can control the growth. Grow it on single crystal silicon, grow it on sapphire. These are commercially available substrates. So just taking a very simple PVD process with e-beam evaporation, you can actually grow these oriented films. And so these are some STM images taken from Manny Soriaga. We, we, this is part of JCAP, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. And he's an expert in not just STM, but electrochemical STM, uh, where he did these measurements in perchloric acid, uh, minus 0.24 volts versus RHE. And you can see this has uh, got the texture of a copper 111 surface, copper 100, and this is a, akin to a copper 751. We also have lots of x-ray that, that confirms all these structures. So we were able to synthesize them in a large format. We were able to do the STM under electrochemical conditions, confirm that those surfaces exist. We have the x-rays. What did they do electrochemically? Uh, I'll skip through the details on that slide. Uh, but we let me, there's obviously, these are making all kinds of different products. And so I'm going to try to distill the products. One way we think about it is CC coupling. We want to know what catalysts are better at CC coupling and what catalysts are worse. So I want to compare these three surfaces, 111, 100, 751, which has lots of step sites, um, in terms of CC coupling. How many C1s versus C2s versus C3s? We'll just lump them together. And so this is the data for copper 111, these four bars. And notice they're stacked. So this is the, the C1s, these are C2s, and the little pink part is C3s. And the lower potentials, the less negative potentials, it does very little CC coupling. But then that improves as you go more negative. Um, if you look at copper 100 or copper 751, they do, they're much better at CC coupling at uh, these less negative potentials. And they're still uh, very good and better than 111 at the more negative. So that's one thing that we recognize. And that really made us think that under coordination and uh, step sites are good for CC coupling processes. Uh, another thing that we like to track that kind of lumps a lot of products together without going to the finer details is oxygenates versus hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are great. We love them. They're massive. Uh, but they're also the lowest market value, right? They're so cheap, we burn them. So if you want to like sell technology, you're probably a better market entry point is oxygenate. So we pay very close attention to making oxygenated species. And so now these three bars reflect the oxygenate to hydrocarbon ratio for 100, 751, and 111, where the less negative potentials, 111 doesn't make almost any oxygenates compared to hydrocarbons. Um, and whereas 100 and 751 are much better. And then, uh, but as you go more negative in potential, all three look about the same. So why is that? Uh, and uh, so our theory friends over at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs and at Berkeley, um, Jason Goodpastor, Alex Bell, Martin Head Gordon, uh, they were concurrently coming up with some theory that really explained this phenomenon. Their, their theory suggested at less negative potentials, you expect to have H on the surface, and that serves as your, your hydrogen donor to do the hydrogenation process, the surface-based process. And this makes a lot of sense to us, because if you look at the three crystal structures of 111, we can count the number of nearest neighbors. 111 has a lot of nearest neighbors. You can imagine a lot of hydrogen atoms on that surface that can hydrogenate, and thus you end up with a lot of hydrocarbons. You end up steering it that way. But the 100 and 751 have fewer nearest neighbors, so meaning you don't have as much hydrogen around, and thus you're more likely to end up with a, a less degree of hydrogenation, and hence an oxygenated compound versus a hydrocarbon. Uh, but then why is it that all three are very similar as you go uh, to more negative potentials? Their theory suggests that you don't get the hydrogen from the surface. You actually pluck it straight from the electrolyte. So there should be less surface structure sensitivity because you're just grabbing the proton from solution. And all three surfaces have equal access to that. So this is starting to teach us a little bit of the design rules on surface structure. 
but there's a lot more because the reaction conditions we think play a really big role in this. Uh, and uh, so we looked at, we want to do some experiments. Our conventional conditions are, are uh, CO2 reduction in 0.1 molar potassium bicarbonate, which is about pH 7. Uh, we wanted to look at pH 13, and it's really tough to look at pH 13 with CO2 because you start forming, obviously it's a buffer, and you start forming equilibrium that will steer you towards pH 7. But if you do CO reduction, and we have good reason to believe that CO is a very common intermediate in this process, um, then you can pick whatever pH you want. So let's look at CO reduction in 0.1 molar potassium hydroxide versus CO2 in uh, potassium bicarbonate. And so we had to re-engineer our cell a little bit because CO is, is not very soluble in water. It's one part per million, and so you become transport limited very quickly. Um, so we did some retweaking of that, and we were able to make some measurements in, on the same type of vanilla copper foil that I was describing earlier. Guess what you make? almost all the same products that you made with CO2. So that was, that it definitely it lends one to believe that uh, CO is an important intermediate in this process. But what was really interesting about it is that while the, the types of molecules being made are very similar, the voltages at which the chemistry turns on are drastically different. They're so different, I can actually put them on the same XY plot for you. So versus RHE, here's all your CO reduction data. Here's all the CO2 reduction data. Um, the hollow ones are CO, and you can see like in green, this is propanol, and green in solid is CO, uh, from CO2. This is ethylene up here. Here's ethylene in red here. So you can see they kind of track each other in shape, but they're just offset by about half a volt, at least for the C2 products. The C1 products, here's methane and methane. That's off by a quarter of a volt, which is interesting. So the first question we asked ourselves is, okay, oh, wow, this is drastic. Same, same type of products, but very different potentials for this chemistry to turn on. What's behind this? Is it because we're using CO and CO is easier because uh, you're further down the process or is it because of the electrolyte? And in electrochemistry, one way we can account for that is through uh, shifting just the reference scale um, going to instead of RHE, going to SHE or silver silver chloride. Uh, and there you're not tied to the reaction thermodynamics. There you're looking at the absolute potential. And when you do that, it turns out that a lot of this data overlaps, which tells us the pH is really the big driver here. It's not the only driver. If you look at acetate in, from CO2 and acetate from CO, there's still certainly differences here, uh, where say ethylene, there's less of a difference. Uh, all the, so for all the C2s, I would say that it is just as easy uh, and perhaps a little easier to do it from CO uh, once you account for pH than from CO2. But not methane. Methane, interestingly, here's in black, the solid uh, data is to the right of the, the hollow, which says that it's actually easier to make methane from CO2 than it is from CO uh, under these conditions in, in base. Uh, sorry, uh, it's easier to make methane in neutral than it is to make it, um, methane in base. So, uh, so, we're, so pH, we think, plays a really big effect. Why is that? We think this has a lot to do with the cations that are in solution, in this case, potassium. And it turns out that, that potassium can change the, uh, the electrostatic landscape of that interfacial layer, literally the first half nanometer away from your electrode. And that potassium, we think, really helps CC coupling processes. But it doesn't help the C1 processes at all. So that's why methane doesn't get the, the boost when you do a CO in base, but all the uh, C2 plus species do. So that's, that, those are some words on the activity. Let's, let's look at selectivity. What happens when you're at more positive potentials or less negative potentials? So CO reduction, now we're switching back to the RHE scale. CO reduction versus CO2, guess what? Your oxygenate to hydrocarbon ratio is way better CO in base than it is CO2 in neutral. And this makes a lot of sense because you're at a less negative potential. You're closer to the equilibrium thermodynamics of the overall process, and thus you don't have as much hydrogenation power. So you should end up with more oxygenates and, and less fully reduced product. You can see this trend very clearly. Uh, CC coupling, I mentioned that is another metric that we pay attention to. Guess what? In under CO conditions, you're making almost entirely CC coupled products very early in potentials. Only at the more negative potentials do you start seeing the C1s. And this is also consistent with the trend that uh, if you're facilitating that, that, if you're bringing the potassium to the surface uh, to facilitate CC coupling and you can have it happen early enough, that means you're facilitating the CC coupling step without helping the methane production, uh, which, is, which happens further down here. So this is another way of steering selectivity. So surface structure can steer selectivity. Reaction conditions can steer selectivity. Still a lot to unpack here. Um, let me skip ahead. Uh, a big part of us trying to understand this is invoking uh, mass transport modeling. And so what we really want, so here's your electrode. 
and here is your adsorbed species. We really want to know what is in that solution right there, just kind of right within striking distance. Again, five angstroms away within you know, that, with that inner Helmholtz plane, outer Helmholtz plane. What's happening there? Um, and that is very, a very good question and uh, that many people are trying to address. Um, to start addressing that, we're trying to stitch together. Ultimately, you need quantum mechanical models to do this portion correctly. But you can use continuum-based modeling to do the rest. And so that's what we've been up to. Uh, if you take a look at the poisson nernst planck equation, this is just a way of accounting for convection, diffusion, migration. We know what our reaction rates are. We can measure those. And so we can kind of figure all this out such that under any, different, any given circumstance, we can figure out what's our bulk electrolyte composed of. That's an easy thing for us to measure. What's the pH, for instance? What's your concentration of CO2? And then as a function of uh, your reaction rate, you can figure out within that boundary layer, how does pH change? You know, how do potassium ion concentrations change? How does the concentration of CO2 change? And what's the concentration of CO2 changes? How does bicarbonate and carbonic acid, for instance, change? So there's a lot of, a lot of good, uh, a lot of modeling that one could do to quantify the presence of these species. And I don't want to dive terribly into this data. There's a lot of mass transport modeling data. This is really just to say, uh, we've been doing um, a lot of work in this space, and I'm just going to throw in a whole bunch of data here that is not going to be something we're going to spend the time to parse out. But what I will say is that we're trying to keep track of things like the concentration of CO2 at that interface. And it turns out that when you see things like this where the concentration of CO2 starts to plummet, a big reason why is because you're cranking out hydrogen, which is a competitive reaction, and then you hit that second pKa of carbonic acid that starts pulling the equilibrium even further away from CO2. So whatever CO2 you had dissolved in your bulk starts disappearing at that interface, and it, and it kills your uh, selectivity to CO2-reduced products. So there's a lot. We can certainly talk about this later. I just more than anything want to just bring up the importance of mass transport modeling in this. Now, what can we take to learn all these kind of like uh, little tidbits of understanding we're collecting along the way. What, what can we do to actually make a better catalyst? So this pointed us in the directions. We know that CO reduction, there's some benefits there. High pH can be good as long as you're not depleting your CO2. Uh, so what can you do if you want to feed CO2 in your reactor and make a product? We asked the question, what if you put gold nanoparticles on top of copper? We know that copper is very good at uh, making these CC coupled products even better at CO in base than CO2 in neutral. But we want to feed CO2, and, and if we do this in aqueous electrolyte, we're, we're a little bit stuck there. Uh, not exactly, but for the purpose of this conversation, yes. Uh, and so we said, what, you take a material like gold, gold's very good at reducing CO2 to make CO. So if you could get a local production of CO and have an overpressure of CO at that interface, which is greater than what you'd get by just feeding CO, maybe we can get this to happen. So a tandem catalysis scheme at a molecular length scale. And uh, so we made this type of material. I won't dive into that characterization, but let's just get to the, really the punchlines of, of that it works. Uh, we can look at, we can track how much of the CO2 goes to these greater than two electron products, how many moles per square centimeter per second. And here's gold, makes very, very little of those types of products. Here's copper. You guys saw lots of copper data earlier. If you put gold on top of copper, you get something synergistically better. At these lower voltages, you get a hundredfold increase in the reaction rate to converting CO2 to greater than two electron products. What are you making? Prim primarily alcohols, primarily uh, ethanol and propanol. And that's quantified up here. The, here's the current density. Gold and copper don't make any of these species alone in this space, but you put gold on copper and you do. Uh, this is the current densities that we're measuring. This is the Faraday efficiency, so it's modest, 5 to 10% current efficiency. But the fact that you can actually turn on the chemistry in a window that could, you couldn't turn on before with either component alone really speaks to a different approach to designing a catalyst material with some bifunctionality in there. So again, we're trying to unpack all these design principles <coughs> with a, a goal of C2 plus oxygenates. How do you control like, hydrocarbons versus oxygenates, C1s versus C2s? Some are pH dependent, some are pH independent. A lot of this knowledge has really helped us steer towards high surface area formulations of copper. Excuse me one second while I take a sip of tea. And here's the goal. What we've learned is if you operate at more positive potentials, it's interesting. Not only can you, if you can get your electrode to work at high, more positive potentials, that favors oxygenate selectivity. <coughs> and that is a, um, and the other thing is that uh, if you feed CO, that improves a lot. If you operate in base, it, it helps a lot. And so our approach was, hey, just go after some really high surface area formulations of copper. Who cares what kind of sites are there? And so there's a big debate in the literature. Are there special sites? You know, do this type of chemistry or not? That type of chemistry? I, honestly, I think to within an order of magnitude, uh, special sites are not doing anything that 
special. Like in other words, uh, one type of undercoordinated site versus a different type of undercoordinated site. I think they're pretty similar. That's just my, I don't have definitive proof on that. Tough thing to prove. But uh, to test this hypothesis, we just grabbed from the uh, supercapacitor literature. Some of you might work in that space. Supercapacitors are just a means of energy storage. You apply a voltage, you pull ions up, you, you discharge it, you ions go away, and there it's all a surface effect. They want really high surface area materials. So we took this high, high surface area copper, roughness factor of 400, so if you're staring at a one centi square centimeter sample, it's actually 400 square centimeters of surface area. Um, this is what it looks like as synthesized, just grabbing a literature prep <clears throat> after electrochemistry. It gets even more kind of defected, more, more surface area. And when we did the measurement for CO reduction in base, for all the reasons we talked about before, we could get this chemistry to turn on very low, uh, very early potentials, now only minus 0.23 volts. And effectively, 100% of the electrons are going to C2 plus oxygenated products. Almost none to C2, uh, sorry, none to H2, none to uh, hydrocarbons. And uh, it's ethanol, acetate, and acetaldehyde. Those are the three products we've got here, as opposed to the 16 products that we were talking about before. And they're all a very similar type. They're all high value products. And uh, if, you, if you crank the voltage more negative, because you want a higher reaction rate, yes, you can react more CO and get a higher reaction rate. But you're going to start paying a price. You start losing the selectivity of the C2 plus oxygenates and start favoring hydrocarbons or even making some hydrogen as well, which is exactly what you would expect. So these are using these are some design principles that we're putting into a, just what I consider the, this is a, not a very fancy system. It's just a high surface area copper. If I take this data and I normalize it to polycrystalline copper on a turnover frequency basis, it's almost identical. Okay, it's just that the really high surface areas allow us to operate at more positive potentials, and the more positive your potential, the less you favor hydrocarbons, the more oxygenates you have. Voila. All right. Uh, in the last five minutes, let me wrap up with uh, just a different theme to give you a different flavor. Uh, what, so, so this is hard chemistry to steer, but at least we can make them. We can make the products. We can get the chemistry to go. What, when you, what about facing something really tough? And what I'm going to talk about is extraordinarily tough, taking the nitrogen in the air that we're breathing in and STP converting that into ammonia. Okay, That's a, a different proposition. Uh, again, great team of people working together with. I want to call out uh, working with many faculty as well. Stacy Bent, Mateo Caniello at Stanford, Jens Norsko, who's now back at DTU, Eve Korkendorf, my former postdoc advisor. This is funded uh, through the Willem Fund, which is a private foundation in uh, Denmark that uh, started this project because they were interested in sustainability. Imagine that. Uh, so here's the deal. So ammonia, Haber Bosch, we talked about it. Super important, feeds billions of people worldwide. It's an extraordinary process, a modern marvel, a feat of human science and engineering. Works so great, uh, but there are problems. One of the problems is distribution. This has to be done in centralized facilities. Why? Because these are the conditions. It could be 100 bar, 200 bar, 300 bar pressure. You can't decentralize that. Okay, this is a big, large-scale systems, and then you send it around, typically through tankers like this, for instance, and then you fertilize fields. And uh, the thing is, if you look globally, more than half of the ammonia that came out the plant gate ends up as an environmental problem and did not go into the crop that you intended it to, to be. So uh, why is that? It's all really a distribution issue, and that's a distribution issue that's true here in the U.S. You know, like there, trust me, we got lots of access to fertilizer around here in the Central Valley. Uh, and in Illinois and many other, and every part of the U.S. really. But what happens if you start going to other places, Africa, India, a lot of pl uh, places where there's a need for food and they don't have the same access. The cost of fertilizer to them is six times higher than what we would pay for. So how do you, how do you facilitate all of that? Here's the dream. The dream is you come up with a catalyst that can convert nitrogen into ammonia at STP. That electrocatalyst, you couple it to a solar cell, and when the sun is shining and when there's water present, which is exactly when the crops want to grow, your catalyst is already embedded in there and making the ammonia that you have uh, sized appropriately so that the rate of ammonia production is commensurate with what uh, the, the plants want, what the crops want. So that's all fine and good. What's the challenge? Is the, this, this reaction is a really tough one to catalyze at STP. There's a reason why Haber-Bosch is done at such high temperatures and pressures. And uh, here's some theory from Jens Norsko that explains why, in a nutshell, uh, you've got voltage on this axis. This is the, the voltage that you need to apply to get the reaction to thermodynamically be favorable uh, on these different surfaces. And uh, the bottom line is that all these very negative potentials are needed for these catalysts, you're, uh, whereas this is the negative uh, voltage you need for these catalysts for hydrogen. You're always going to favor hydrogen, always. And that's the problem. It's a selectivity problem. Yes, technically, you could reduce N2 to ammonia STP, but if you're making hydrogen at nine orders of magnitude greater rate, it's useless for you. Uh, it's a, a bad use of energy. So 
how do we get around that? Um, there are a lot of strategies, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time. We can do this in the Q&A if you'd like. We've outlined the strategies. These are literally, this is our board of ideas that we've published. It's out there. If you want to think about ammonia electric catalysis, I encourage you to, to look into this work and think about these different strategies. This is exactly what we're implementing, okay? And we continue forward uh, with that, but it's hard. Uh, we did come up with a workaround, and here's the workaround is how do you avoid the hydrogen evolution is you, you make discrete steps where the electrochemistry happens and where the water becomes involved. So for instance, uh, if you take a molten salt, you can uh, potassium chloride, let's say, you can throw some lithium hydroxide and, uh, and you heat it up to say 350 degrees C, but at one atmosphere pressure, you give me cheap renewable electricity, I can electroplate lithium for you. You make that lithium, you take it out, you, you, you expose it to N2. You don't even have to heat it up at all if you want. You heat it up a little bit, it makes it go faster. You go from lithium metal plus N2 goes to lithium nitride. Once you make that lithium nitride, you just dunk it in water. You hydrolyze the nitride. You make lithium hydroxide and ammonia. The ammonia is released. You capture that, and you take the lithium uh, hydroxide. You recapture it, put it right back in your molten salt, and electroplate again. And you can just keep going around and around. And we've shown that we can do this many cycles, uh, and 90% of the electrons are going to ammonia. Okay, so that's a pretty good Faraday efficiency. Now it does require a lot of voltage because you're plating lithium, and lithium is a really you know it requires a lot of negative potential to, to plate. But we've done the analysis, and a typical agricultural field requires about 100 kilos of ammonia per hectare per year. A hectare is 10,000 square meters, right? So it's 100 meters by 100 meters. So that's like two football fields big, uh, and 100 kilos per two football fields per year is actually not that bad. If you have a 90% Faraday efficiency process, even you know we use four volt chemistry, it turns out you only need five square meters of solar cells. And I asked our, our, our very talented postdoc, Adam, to uh, con use PowerPoint to construct this at, at, at roughly to scale. So if you're a farmer and this is your farmland, and I say you gotta, you gotta cover this much with solar cells, I don't think that's gonna scare them away if they can supply all the ammonia without ever having a truck show up, uh, without ever having to deal with that uh, infrastructure. Uh, so let me summarize and conclude. So first of all, I think sustainable pathways of fuels and chemicals are promising. I, I do see a new paradigm emerging. We need a lot of technology and a lot of spaces to make that happen. But there's, there's work that's happening. Uh, it's, things are moving. Progress has been made in developing catalysts with zero or low content precious metals. We've been able to integrate a lot of non-precious metal hydrogen catalysts into commercial grade electrolyzers. Um, we've come up with a, a lot of strategies to selectively convert CO or CO2 into C2 plus oxygenates. And uh, I identified some of the challenges in nitrogen electrocatalysis. We've identified some workarounds to that. Um, new strategies, this is uh, more challenging, uh, but uh, would be, I think, game changing for a lot of reasons if we could uh, feed more people on Earth more readily. Uh, so with that, let me thank a number of people. I've been thinking, thanking lots of, certainly, of my uh, coworkers along the way. I want to thank JCAP for funding for the CO2 stuff, the Navy for the SBIR on the proton onsite collaboration, uh, NSF and, and GSEP and Office of Science have really funded a lot of the fundamental catalyst work. Um, EERE at DOE has funded a lot of the applied work that we do, VLM for the work on ammonia. And of course, thank you all for your attention and for being a great audience. I'd be really thrilled to answer any questions. So thank you very much. Please, yes. Yes, uh, for sure. And, and uh, concentrated ammonia, uh, sorry, concentrated uh, solar power can be manifested in a couple of ways. You could either use it to uh, do thermal-based processes, right? So basically, you're, you make lots of heat and, and thus pressure, and thus you could run Haber-Bosch type chemistry in principle um, with concentrated thermal. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is through uh, more redox reactions, so kind of uh, solar thermal chemical cycles, where you take, uh, say, a metal oxide that uh, if, you, if it's under reducing conditions, you get defects, and then, uh, if you, uh, and then if you, those defects, if you expose it to water, you can pluck the oxygen off of water and make the H2, and you, know, you can do these types of schemes with N2 and H2 and try to, uh, to make ammonia for sure. There's been work in that space. And then there's concentrated solar power to make electricity that if you had an electrochemical-based uh, process, 
process, uh, you could you could drive uh, ammonia synthesis. Uh, people have done um, higher temperature hybrids, I would say, with electrochemical and thermochemical. Uh, so hybridizing that also definitely has potential. The, the big reason, by the way, if you're not aware, I mean, Haber-Bosch is such an important process uh, for all of us. Uh, the reason why you, you, you have these high pressure systems is because of, it's actually not the thermodynamics. It turns out that at STP right now, if you give me hydrogen and nitrogen, the uh, thermodynamic uh, preferred product is ammonia. Uh, and so there's the, the challenges in the kinetics, and the kinetics are that if you had a material, a catalyst material, uh, what we'd hope for is something that operates near room temperature such that you could basically split the NN bond and split HH bonds and then you have all the Ns and the Hs on your surface. You could recombine them and make your ammonia. But uh, the problem is any catalysts that are so uh, good at splitting the NN bond uh, are, hold that nitrogen so tightly and so dearly and it's, that's why they're able to split the NN bond in the first place that that nitrogen just kind of refuses to come off. So you have to crank up the temperature to get the hydrogenation process to work to release that N. And as you crank up the, temp the, pre sorry, the temperature to say uh, 500 degrees C, then the thermodynamics change uh, and then ammonia is uphill and the only way to get it back downhill is cranking up the pressure. So uh, said another way is that there, the thermochemical processes do have promise if you can find a catalyst that can operate closer to lower temperatures uh, would do wonders. Um, and so we're definitely looking into that as well. Uh, given the importance of this reaction, it's one of the most studied in history. It's about 100 years old. It's been estimated that a quarter of a million different catalysts have been investigated for Haber-Bosch for ammonia synthesis. So just to give you, like, so we need some new ideas. We need some fresh ideas. We need some creative approaches. And so that's why I want to kind of motivate any of you who want to think about ammonia. We need to come up with fundamentally different approaches. And, and our approach with the electrochemistry, which has been certainly tried by many and, and with certain levels of success, uh, the question is, can you use electric fields, for instance, to do something different? Uh, can you control proton transfer uh, and uh, a way, uh, different from electron transfer? Um, uh, there's, there's different, you have a little bit more knobs to turn, I think, um, in terms of engineering that landscape at that local level, kind of like with the CO2 with pH effects and things, uh, cation presence. I think there's a lot of opportunity to do things that thermochemistry doesn't have, um, isn't quite geared for in the same way. Yes. Great. So the question is, how does heat mass transfer affect uh, the CO2 electrochemical reaction? Great question. Um, we're just starting to get a flavor for starting to answer that question. Um, the reactors that I showed you here, so we do, uh, so, you know, we do a lot of catalyst development, certainly in the group. Uh, we do a lot of reactor development in the group too, and sometimes it's to make you know things that are like the MEAs I was showing that are more like kind of commercial grade devices. Sometimes there are uh, different types of reactors aimed to just to probe fundamentals in a different way. Uh, and the CO2 stuff that I had presented, that, those reactors are absolutely designed for fundamental studies where we're trying to understand intrinsic catalyst kinetics um, and try to avoid uh, mass transport effects, so to speak. Uh, it turns out that's impossible for the reasons I was. I was uh, bringing up. Uh, but what we're also working on in parallel are what I would call higher conversion systems that are designed for high throughput, high flows, uh, in high flow, flow feed rates, high flow outputs. And there, a lot of things can change. Um, among other things, for instance, uh, if you have, a, say, a gas diffusion electrode type environment um, with an ionomer, uh, there maybe it's possible to do CO2 reduction in very basic conditions, very alkaline conditions. Uh, even though equilibrium would say, oh, it should be pH 7, if you're shoving it in there fast and hard enough, then it doesn't have time to equil equilibrate. You can actually do the catalysis, maybe under a condition that might be more amenable to doing the, the chemistry. So there's a lot of good questions there in terms of reactor design and development. And part of it is the, and a lot of it is, is mass transport, uh, as you were bringing up. Uh, and, and I think controlled proton delivery uh, and decoupling that from electron delivery, I think, is a key here for selectivity. That's one way I think we can just uh, steer the kinetics of the reaction. Uh, but another one is the, the heat and what, is, what does temperature do for you? And um, one of the, the general questions is, you know, are CC coupling steps um, more electrochemical or thermochemical? 
And so if it's thermochemical, this uh, provides an opportunity. There's a way of, if you just dial up temperature, then you can actually facilitate that step without maybe uh, affecting the rate of hydrogenation. Um, and thus, you know, maybe get end up with more C2 plus oxygenates. So these are all good questions. Uh, I wouldn't say there's definitive answers. There's a lot of answers. People are answering these questions in different ways. Uh, we're, we're, I still think, a ways away from having a, a, you know, an overarching framework for understanding these. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges, by the way, is that these catalysts are all very sensitive to uh, a lot of these factors. And so uh, the catalyst that you make and study under these conditions in the same catalyst would perhaps operate very differently under different conditions. But when you translate from this type of cell to this type of cell, you might have done something to actually change your catalyst too. So that one-to-one -one correspondence is also a, a, a tough thing to attain. So it just means there's more work for us to do uh, to figure all this out. Yes? And we can always have more students dive in. So uh, yeah, please. I have a specific question, which is I spent a lot of time on uh, Phosphorus on metal phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of like, so as you know, nickel phosphides are very active in mm -hmm. PR. That's right. Did you see this uh, paper from Rutgers recently? Mm -hmm. From this person yeah. from yep. a lot of popular press that they're showing that 99% mm -hmm. selective for right. C2, plus, but 90% to C4. Plus. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, this is a long step, but I'm just sort of wondering what you think about what the low over potential and what's special about hydride transfers compared to the low over. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. So let me let me reformulate that question with the with the microphone on. I mean, the question, the overarching question is uh, phosphides and CO two reduction and uh, hydrides and uh, steering catalysis towards CC coupled products and uh, you know at low over potentials. And uh, I will say that there's been a lot of work on phosphides in general that we've done. A lot of other people have done. It is int intriguing because when we the phosphides we've looked at typically do not do much with CO two reduction. Uh, they typically do. They favor a lot of hydrogen evolution. Um, having said that, the phosphides and the ionic compounds in general, there's a lot of um, a lot of variability in the surfaces that I think we can take advantage of. So whereas metals, you know, uh, when I showed you guys copper, for instance, 100 versus 111 versus 751, yes, there are differences, no question about it. But if you really zoom out at 30,000 feet, it, it, it's making things that copper looks to make. You're not fundamentally completely reworking the chemistry. I think these ionic compounds, whether they're metal oxides or nitrides or carbides or sulfides, are very dependent on the stoichiometry and the coordination environment. And so I think there are ways of, uh, I think there's more flexibility in the material or more uh, variability in the material to execute different chemistries. Uh, and I think one thing that's really interesting about the phosphides, and I, I might uh, just kind of jump to one of my previous slides here. Um, uh, that was remarkable. I went right on it. So uh, Metis' work on the phosphides. Um, so, you know, just to give you a sense of uh, differentiation, here's a phosphide that's actually doing CO2 conversion, right? It's making methanol selectively. Uh, it makes a little bit of ethanol and a few other things, methane, uh, but predominantly methanol. And uh, the reason why the, so the commercial catalyst is copper zinc oxide, right? That's, there's 100 billion tons, or sorry, 100 billion kilos a year of methanol that's produced, almost all of it over copper zinc oxide. Copper zinc oxide, I mentioned, is, it just requires a very specific stoichiometry or feed ratio of CO, CO2, and this one's very flexible. Why is that? It turns out if you put too much uh, CO2 in the copper zinc oxide system, the, the CO2 binds by dentate and starts poisoning the sites and blocking sites and, and cutting down the reaction. And we don't see that here, and we wondered why, because electronically there were a lot of similarities for binding. The key is the difference in the lattice constant of mol molybdenum phosphide versus uh, a transition metal, in that case, copper. And uh, the CO2 in this case is just, it, the, the, the ionic distance is just too large uh, for CO2 to bind bidentate, so you don't end up with a formate poison, you end up with monodentate uh, binding, and that weakens the binding and prevents it from being the poison that it is with transition metals. So this is one aspect as to how um, uh, an ionic compound like a phosphide in particular with a different lattice constant 
um, can execute chemistries with CO2 differently than a transition metal might, plus, of course, the um, hydrogen binding property. So the way I look at it, if you're, if you're thinking about um, doing CO2 uh, conversion thermochemically or electrochemically, there's kind of three species to think about. There's oxygenated species, there's oxygen, there's carbon, and there's hydrogen, right? Those are the three key players. And so I think tuning the binding energies of these species uh, to have the right balance so you have the right mix on your surface is, uh, is a design principle. And with transition metals, oftentimes, you know, if you know the binding energy of one, you kind of know the binding energy of all. They all have some general levels of correlation. Copper is an exception, and that's why I think copper is such a special transition metal and what it can do electrochemically. And then if we start looking at other variants, phosphides, nitrides, sulfides, et cetera, there's, uh, I wonder what, uh, what we can find in terms of finding that right balance. So uh, some, some things that I, I've been thinking about. You bet. Other questions, students, anything? Yes. Uh, yeah, so the question is, you know, power to gas technologies, you know, Europe uh, versus U.S., Europe seems to be adopting it uh, more, and I would agree. In general, uh, they're adopting policies um, and, and uh, in incentivizing and subsidizing and getting these things off the ground. I think there is a great question that you asked. There's, I think, a lot of reasons for this. There's a lot of forces. It turns out in Europe, a lot of the forces are more aligned in that direction than in the United States. Um, I'll give you a very simple one. Uh, we have really cheap natural gas. Uh, the dollar twenty per kilo that I was quoting, I was very specific to say that's in the United States. In Europe, it's at least twice as much, and so they don't, you know, they, they have a different value proposition, um, and so that's one reason. Another reason is that they've also been uh, much more forward on deploying uh, renewable electricity. So that's another reason. Uh, and so they have got, they have a curtailing problem. Not that we don't. California curtails California one terawatt hour a year. And that number is only going up, right, as we deploy more and more renewables. And so, uh, and so you know, that's California, that's not USA. Um, Europe has just a lot more uh, of that challenge to, uh, to solve as well. Um, they also have, generally speaking, uh, tighter regulations on things like pollution, emissions, you know, uh, cities, you know, are cities in, going to be inhabitable? There's a lot of uh, questions given the population density of some of the big cities out there that, not that we don't have big cities here, but, um, you know, I can think of some big cities nearby where pollution is not, uh, you know, where pollution is an issue and, and uh, it, maybe there's not as aggressive uh, an approach to that. So, you know, there's, and, and, and those are just a few factors to cite. Um, having said that, in the U.S., there definitely is motion in this space. So it's not zero. Um, I think if you, you know, I think there's more happening in Europe than there is in the U.S., but I, I, it, the good news is that I, I even see in private industry, I see in a lot of oil and gas companies, uh, that they are um, looking into these sorts of things and, and uh, they want to be on the forefront. And I think one of the things that we have to thank for that is frankly fracking, because fracking uh, to me is the greatest, uh, it was such a game changer, right? If you look at the price of oil and natural gas, it was just going up and up and up. And I, I thought, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that that was just going to just keep going up and, and maybe level off at some point, but there's no way it would go back down. And it completely went back down. And, uh, and I just, it was astounding what happened and everybody's eyes opened up and said, whoa, that's crazy. And that was a technological revolution is what allowed that to happen. And in the oil and gas community, you know, there's lots of technological revolutions we're all facing, right? We all have, you know, these amazing, you know, powerful smartphones in our pockets. Everyone's got laptops, smartphones. We're all connected globally. We've got, uh, you know, we have uh, the transportation sector and electric cars and hybrids and fuel cells and all these things, you know. But for to an oil and gas person, the, the fact that a technology changed and completely obliterated the market structure and the, the value propositions, and that just, that told them that, wow, technology can completely revolutionize something. So that's what I see in their eyes. And so when they look at this stuff these days, that, I think that's a framework like, wow, if a technology really does uh, improve, it might actually change the, the game. We'd better be part of this. And so I'm seeing that, thankfully, more and more. So the U.S. has definitely got some, some movement in this space. Let's hope it, it keeps climbing. Yes. So speaking of uh, curtailment, you said that you'd like to be able to drive a lot of these processes during times when there is renewable energy on the grid. How well or economically can you cycle on and off to only operate during those times? 
That's a, that's a phenomenal point. Thank you for asking that. Something I, I did not address. I just kind of mentioned something uh, half whimsically in passing. The truth is that I don't think that you can uh, build a, uh, a good business plan, a good business model on just using curtailed electricity. Uh, even though they, somebody might pay you to take it, it's just coming in too infrequently. Uh, the way to think about it is that oil refineries, for instance, if we want to use that as a, a model of how we do business, they're operating 24-7, 365, right? They're continually making product. Yes, it costs a billion dollars, and so does a Haber-Bosch plant, and so does a methanol plant. They cost, you, know, you invest a billion dollars, but you know what your stream is coming in. Roughly, you know what your stream is coming out. These things are designed to last for 60 years, and you know that you know, you're going to be making money. At some point, you'll be able to pay that back and start making a profit. And uh, when you start saying, oh, well, I'm going to have my machine on 10% of the time, 5% of the time, that's a lot, that, that really restricts how much capital you can spend, um, you know, because it's only on so little. You're making product only here and there. You know, it better be dirt, dirt cheap if that's the case. And so uh, the truth is, is that I think there's a lot of solutions. When I presented this, this uh, these four boxes of, uh, you know, these targets, I, if we do all four of these, the paradigm is completely changed and there's no reason to be using fossil fuels anymore, if you ask me. Um, but that's a big, that's a big target. And even if we had three of the four or two of the four, we're in pretty good shape. This 20 cents per kilogram product is just, that's CapEx irrespective of your duty cycle. Is it on 100% of the time, 50% of the time, 10% of the time? It just means that if this thing's on 10% of the time, then that's going to be, the 20 cents is going to be way harder to reach. And you have to have really, really low cost tech. And so, um, so that's a balancing act. And different markets are going to require different things. I do think that there's a lot of uh, technologies that are going to come on stream in, in uh, what I view in kind of the energy storage world and grid, smart grids and things to flow electricity. Uh, I don't think we need a, ta I, I wouldn't start uh, thinking about a company that works uh, on a device that works only 10% of the time when, when prices you know, X cents or less. Uh, I would, I think more 50% is something that we can more reliably count on and perhaps even 80% if we're really good about getting those other technologies on. So um, but it's a good question and ultimately it's a very regional question. So uh, what you would do in the Bay Area versus what you would do in Texas versus what you would do in Florida versus what you would do in Scandinavia or in Japan, right? They're all different, uh, different markets. So something to think about. But it, it does uh, definitely trend towards low cost. We need low cost devices. Question here. Yeah, no, that's it. so so right. Thank you for saying this. So the question is why uh, why a chemical or catalytic route as opposed to using bacteria? So nitrogenase that I brought up earlier, of course, is a world famous uh, nitrogen fixer at STP. Uh, it is a not efficient. Uh, Haber Bosch is actually more efficient than nitrogenase, FYI. Uh, B, um, it is all, not very selective. You know, for every molecule of ammonia, it's spitting out I think three molecules of H two, um, and it's very slow. Um, and so uh, now that doesn't mean it's, it's useless by any means. And there are, are folks for sure who are looking to engineer microbes and nitrogenase to improve that. And I think it's a great strategy. So I wouldn't say that um, it's a strategy that shouldn't be employed. It's just uh, that's not currently where we're working on. And I completely empower those who do. So that's, I think the biological transformations, I think biologi biology is really good at a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to give you in a nutshell, how I view it and how it impacts our work. Um, biomimetics is something that a lot of folks think about and work on. At different, I, I view it as, you know, you've got the true biological system and you've got, let's say, you know, a zeolite in a, in a, doing hydro treating in an oil refinery. Those are two very different extremes of an axis of catalysis, but they're both catalysis. And uh, people work in kind of different regions of this, of this axis that I'm kind of drawing. Uh, what I would say, what I try to learn from biology is, uh, I think if you're trying to mimic the active site directly, I, that's great that people are doing that. That's not our approach. We're, we're, we're trying to zoom out like maybe one or two levels further away and say, what's the functionality of the enzyme? And I want to mimic the functionality of the enzyme, not, not, not the atomistic details of the enzyme, but the functionality of the enzyme. That's just like our approach. And I think there's three things that enzymes do extremely well. Uh, I think number one, uh, they're three-dimensional. 
And I think that's important. I showed you a ton of surfaces here. Effective, like, yeah, they're nanostructures and nanoparticles and nanopores, but at the end of the day, if you're a CO2 molecule or an N2 molecule and you're arriving at that surface, as far as you're concerned, it's flat. It's as flat as the land out here, right? So, okay, step one. Uh, enzymes are three-dimensional. You, when you have helping hands coming from a three-dimensional around you, I think that can steer the catalysis. Number two, they're very dynamic. So these surfaces are dynamic too. Uh, atoms can certainly move around, but enzymes are designed to really change their conformation, change their shape in really interesting ways. Protein residues coming in, protein residues zooming out. Like that, that dynamics where it can do step one in this way, step two in this way, step three in this way, step four in that way. I think that also uh, allows you to have a better landscape for every step of the reaction as opposed to here's this kind of static structure and I'm expecting that static structure to do all steps in my reaction well. And then the third thing, that enzymes do really well is that they control delivery of reactants and products. And so nitrogenase does this as well. And so they can actually bring in protons at the right rate, bring in electrons at the right way, rate. And I've kind of alluded to this point. I think that's a way of, that's one thing that electrocatalysis can do that thermal heterogeneous catalysis is not really geared to do is really di uh, distinguishing proton rate from electron rate. And I think that's another way of attacking selectivity. So these are the functionalities that I think about. So we're not trying to like build an enzyme or, or work off of enzymes. We're trying to use these design principles to make solid state systems. Um, that's just our approach. There's many other great approaches that I think are, are, are worth looking into. And, uh, but at the level that we're looking at, it's kind of like saying, um, hey, if, if I want to you know, fly from SFO to New York, um, I could build a contraption that, that flaps its wings, or I could come up with a different design uh, to get me there. And so it's kind of the functionality, not necessarily the, the exact uh, mechanistic working. So that's kind of how we're looking at it. Thank you again for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.